invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Jonah one more time as we study this uh, short, just four chapters, a minor prophet, not minor, of course, in importance, but in length, falling into shorter prophetic books, following the biggies like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, even Daniel. Uh, but uh, we've been looking at Jonah over these last several weeks today in chapter 4 for the conclusion. So hear the word of the Lord from the book of Jonah, chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from, dis from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now, the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Let's pray. Father, open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word this morning. Father, open our hearts that they might receive your word and open our hearts to us that you might show us what is there in our hearts as we look at your word. Father, nourish our souls on the nutritious word of God that you'd bless the preaching of your word, Father, to the building of your church, to our each of our uh, growth and grace, knowledge of you, and Father, we worship you for the hearing of your word. Amen. Our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, is somewhat unusual in that it comes to a conclusion with a question. The book of Jonah also ends with a question. But before we get there, we need to look at the beginning of chapter 4, Going from Jonah chapter 3 to Jonah chapter 4, and remember that's a, a later division that didn't exist originally, but as we go to what we know as chapter 4, is one of the weirdest twists that you'll find not only in Scripture, but really anywhere. Jonah goes to Nineveh, finally obeys the Lord, goes to Nineveh, preaches its overthrow, and... Astoundingly, the Ninevites listen, and they they just all start repenting, and not only repenting, they name their sin, the evil, the violence, and they're fasting, and they're putting on sackcloth to afflict themselves, 
and calling on God for mercy, and even the king makes it official with this declaration that they all do it, and not only the people, but the animals participate in this abasing themselves, seeking the mercy of the Lord, and uncertainly, as the king says, who knows, maybe God will have mercy on us. Maybe he will respond with his kindness and, and, and not destroy the city. And in fact, God does respond with mercy. He relents. He spares the city of Nineveh. That's a good thing, right? No, not if you're Jonah. Jonah's name means dove. Jonah was not a dove, but very much a hawk in his demeanor toward Nineveh. But it's also true, and maybe you pick up on this, as we read through Jonah chapter 4, it's one of the saddest and, in fact, most disturbing chapters that you will read in the Bible. It's this man, this prophet of the Lord, no less, who is so consumed by his hatred for the Ninevites that he not only can't rejoice in a display, an amazing display of God's mercy to them, but he is not just mad, he is absolutely furious that God would show mercy to these people that he despises. He is furious when a merciful God displays his mercy. So let's take a look. As you go through the chapter, God asks Jonah three questions, kind of, with each section. And so we're going to organize our examination of this passage with those three questions, the questions that God asks Jonah and kind of implicitly asks the reader too. We're invited to, to join in and kind of answer, but also uh, answer as Jonah should answer, but also answer as we ourselves would answer. So the first question that we see, God questions Jonah. He questions Jonah. He questions his anger over the sparing of Nineveh. You see this in verses 1 through 4. And Jonah was angry. Literally, uh, that first verse, the Hebrew reads, it was evil to Jonah, a great evil, and it burned to him. I mean, the Hebrew language can scarcely put it more strongly, just how angry and how furious Jonah was over what the Lord did. He was seeing red. He was steam coming out of the ears. He was mad as a wet in, furious. Now, if you were here in chapter 2, we studied when Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, we said that Jonah came out of that experience a changed man. Not perfect, but changed. And you might be tempted to read this chapter and think, well, nothing changed. Yes, it did. Because remember, in chapter 1, when Jonah didn't like what God told him to do and what God was doing and what he thought they feared God would do, what did he do? He ran in the opposite direction, headed toward Tarshish, away from Nineveh, and he ran from God. He was fleeing the presence of the Lord. He does not do that here. He is angry as can be, but what does he do? We see he's, his, he is a changed man here. What does he do? Well, it says, and he prayed to the Lord. He took his anger to the Lord. He didn't run from the Lord. He went to the Lord. That is a huge difference. A quantifiable difference from chapter 1, isn't it? He didn't run from the Lord here. He ran to the Lord in prayer. He is engaged. He is taking his anger to the Lord. Anger for all the wrong reasons. But at least he spoke about his anger to the Lord. He took it up with the Lord. He prayed and told God about it. That's a big change from chapter 1. It's kind of the same thing you see with Job. You know, if you get to the end of Job and it says that the Lord, the Lord vindicates Job and rebukes his friends, you may be scratching your head saying, well, Job was complaining so much. True, but who was he complaining to? God. Job was praying. And he was talking to his friends too, but he was also talking to God. And I think there's a lesson in that. You know, when we are upset with the management, with God's reign and rule over our lives or over this world, 
there's no point in trying to pretend, you know, to, to put on this fake piety. Oh, Father, we thank you for what you're doing. God sees through that. I mean, if you're upset, tell God. He's big. He can take it. That's exactly what Jonah does here. And, and though his heart is all wrong, it is a good thing to do, just as it was for Job, to take his complaints to the Lord. Now, pretend piety doesn't fool him. We honor him when we go to him honestly. Now, there's lines you don't want to cross. You know, we're not to blaspheme him. But if we're unhappy, we can tell the Lord about it. And that's exactly what Jonah does here. He prays, good thing. What he says is shocking. He prayed, he said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah's problem is this. God is too merciful. In fact, Jonah is quoting here from the prophet Joel who himself drew this language from uh, Exodus 34. You'll remember where Moses prays, O Lord, show me your glory. And the Lord puts him in the cleft of the rock and covers him and passes by. He can only see the back of God, not his face. And God declares his name. And that's picked up in several other places in Scripture where God basically describes who he is. And one of those places is Joel, Joel 2.13, which says this, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Very similar to how Jonah quotes it here in his complaint. I didn't want to go there because I knew you are this way. That's why I fled to Tarshish. I knew you're gracious, God. I knew you're merciful. I knew you're slow to anger. I knew you're bound in steadfast love and relent from disaster. Virtually identical to Joel. So what happened? Uh, Nineveh repenting, the Lord relenting, is exactly why Jonah didn't want to go. Exactly why Jonah is so angry now. This, this was his worst fear realized, that the hated Ninevites, and yes, they were a wicked and cruel people, these hated Ninevites would experience the mercy of God. But Jonah's problem is not so much with God's mercy and loving kindness, is it? Jonah was very happy that the Lord showed mercy and kindness and patience to him. Remember the whole episode, he's thrown into the sea. He thought he was going to die. He knew he deserved to die for running from God, disobeying the way he did. And yet the Lord appoints this great fish to, to swallow him up, which must have been horrifying, but it preserved him. It kept him from drowning, kept him alive. And eventually the, the fish spits Jonah back up onto the beach, alive. Disgusting, I'm sure, but alive. And there he was. And Jonah, you know, we have that wonderful prayer in Jonah 2. The mercy, salvation belongs to the Lord. You see, Jonah's problem was not so much with God's mercy and steadfast love, as long as that love and grace and mercy is shown to the right people. Israel. Jonah himself. He was happy to receive God's mercies there. Jonah's anger, his problem, is when God's grace and mercy is shown to the wrong people when it's shown to people like the hated Ninevites. He didn't want them spared. He wanted them burned under the just wrath of God. Verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah so hated the Ninevites and was so angry over God's mercy to them that he would rather die than live in a world where God's mercy is shown to such as the Ninevites. He'd rather be dead. He would rather not continue to live in that kind of world. And so this section then ends with the Lord asking Jonah a question in verse 4. Very simple question. And a very calm question. It kind of reminds me, you know, in, in, in Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve sin against God, and God comes to them and they hide. They're hiding from God. And he just asks them questions. 
Did you eat from the tree I told who told you you were not you were naked? Did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? You know, there's no there's no thunder, there's just this calm questioning. And that's what Jonah gets. The Lord comes to him and says, Jonah, do you do well to be angry? In other words, is your anger right? Is your anger well-founded? Is your anger justified? Is it a righteous anger? Is this a good thing? Do you do well? Are you doing right to be angry? Now, that question is to Jonah, which, by the way, he doesn't answer it, not in the text. Uh, But the question is also to us. As we have assessed everything going on with Jonah, that question comes to us, too. Does Jonah do well to be angry? There might be some readers of Jonah who would say, well, yeah, you know, by people like that, they deserve God's wrath. And justice is not served. But I think it's pretty clear the correct answer, the implied answer is no. Jonah does not do well to be angry. Because, see, for Jonah, it's mercy for me, but not for thee. Is that how it is for you? You're very happy for the Lord to forgive your sins, to show mercy to you, to show you grace in Jesus? I would say, yes, we're very happy about that. But then are we willing to desire that same grace for other people? People we may not like. People who hold opinions different from ours. People whose lifestyles are distasteful to us or offensive to us. Or people who have wronged us or treated us badly. How do you respond when you see people in crazy states of dress or lack thereof marching in gay pride parades? Do you think, smite them, Lord? Or do you think, man, they really need Jesus. Lord, would you convict them of their sin and show them your grace and save them? Maybe it's people of a different political persuasion. Maybe a good text in this year of politics. And it's certainly okay to disagree with people politically. It's okay to have your views and to make your best case for them. Of course that's okay. But here's the thing. Our love for them in Christ, our desire for them, that they should know Christ and be reconciled to God and spared the wrath of God and spared hell because of God's mercy and grace to them in Jesus, must transcend the disagreement. Or the dislike. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to belong to the kingdom of God. A kingdom that transcends all earthly kingdoms, realms, politics, political parties. We're about something that's bigger than all of that. And yes, while we may disagree, while we may find things distasteful, while things are sin, and we're not saying we don't call sin sin, what the scriptures call sin, Are we happy to receive the mercy of God for ourselves and yet resent any mercy God might show to them? Uh, People of other races, other ethnicities, other languages. The great irony in Jonah, and it is a book filled with irony, is that Jonah receives a great dollop of God's mercy. We see that, and he's grateful for it. But when others he doesn't like receives it, he's very angry. The problem is perhaps a sense of entitlement, a sense of righteousness. I deserve God's mercy. I deserve grace. That's a contradiction in terms. Grace, by definition, is undeserved. And the problem is we tend to start thinking, I deserve it, but they don't. Dear friends, you don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve God's grace. I deserve God's wrath. I deserve God's judgment. You do too. There's no one who doesn't. And beware, lest the spirit of Jonah creep in, and we see ourselves as worthy of God's mercy, while those sinners out there are not. There was no one righteous, not one, except Jesus. And if you have righteousness, it's only in Jesus. And they can have righteousness in Jesus, too. So be on guard, lest the spirit of Jonah creep in. Beware the attitude of grace for me, but not for thee. God questions Jonah's anger over his, the Lord sparing Nineveh. And then second, God questions Jonah's anger over the demise of a plant. See that in verses 5 through 9. Jonah, it says, went out. 
of the city and sat to the east to see what would happen. And it makes sense because if he's coming from Israel, he would approach Nineveh from the west, presumably enter the city from the west, go through the city westward to eastward, exit the city to the east, and then go out to the east where he sits to see what is going to happen. It says he made a booth for himself, pretty barren terrain there in Mesopotamia, uh, maybe cobbled some rocks together, some stones, and kind of built a shelter from the wind. And uh, there would not be much vegetation or wood to be able to use for a roof, so probably covered this booth, this shelter, as best he could. But still, the sun's beating down, uh, but a little bit of protection from the wind and the sun. When did this happen? Some, some suggest it happened uh, earlier, uh, maybe after the three days. Some say after the 40 days, you know, waiting to see 40 days in Nineveh will be overthrown. I suspect it was probably earlier, right after Jonah got through going through the city, uh, whenever that was, because uh, he seems to already have an idea that, that God is going to relent, show mercy to the city. He sees the reaction of the Ninevites, and he knows God is merciful to those who repent. And uh, so he's sitting there, but it says he's waiting to see what would happen. Well, we already know he's angry. But, you know, I think with Jonah, you know, if the Ninevites could say, who knows, maybe God will relent. I think Jonah could also say, who knows, maybe after all, God will send down fire and brimstone and destroy the city and certainly want to be here to see it and watch that happen. So maybe, uh, who knows, maybe God will change his mind and blow up Nineveh like Sodom and Gomorrah. So he sat and waited. But man, it was hot. Sun beating down, water scarce. Verse 6 describes his condition as discomfort. It's like when the doctor says, you may feel just a bit of discomfort, right? You get ready to scream in agony. Actually, the Net Bible, I think, captures it better. It just uses the word misery. And, and we can imagine that's, that's what it is. He's hot, he's thirsty, sun's brutal. But it's actually the word for evil, the word for evil, uh, which can have a variety of senses in the Bible. Sometimes it is used for calamity, you know, uh, but that word evil, which occurs several times throughout Jonah. But there may be a double meaning. The plant God raises up to save him from his physical misery, the physical evil, but it may also be an instrument, an object lesson God uses to try to help save Jonah from the evil of his hatred and his lack of compassion for the Ninevites. But either way, it's there to relieve Jonah of this evil, certainly of his misery. Speaking of plants, we see in verse 6, now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. Now, earlier we saw that the Lord appointed, same word, appointed a great fish. And then here he appoints a plant to grow up over Jonah. Uh, the Lord brings these things there and brings them into Jonah's life in order to accomplish his purposes. Uh, later, we'll see it points the wind. Uh, what was the plant? Uh, scholars tend to speculate. Most likely, it seems it could have been a castor oil plant, which can grow quickly, can grow up to 12 feet high, although this was a supernatural growth of this plant, we have to say. And it comes up, it's overshadowing Jonah, and provides better shade, further shade. And the result? So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Well... Jonah is finally happy about something. Literally, he rejoiced with a great joy. Shade, some modicum of comfort as he's waiting to see God destroy the city. And, and the language here reflects, I think, intentionally, I think ironically, uh, the language in verse 1. In verse 1, Jonah is angry with a great anger. Now he's rejoicing with a great joy. Angry that a city was spared, rejoicing that a plant has grown up in his overshading him. But his joy was short-lived. Verse 7, uh, we read that God appointed a worm to attack the plant, and the plant uh, it withers. It's dying, going down, and God appointed a scorching east wind, which wilted both the plant and Jonah, this hot wind. Not a refreshing breeze, but just a hot wind, and uh, something similar maybe in California with the, the fanning the wildfires. This is hot Vicious wind blowing, 
And Jonah is, again, faint. He's miserable. He asks God that he might die. He starts up a, another round of his favorite song, It's Better for Me to Die Than to Live. And again, the Lord speaks to Jonah, has a question. Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And this time Jonah answers, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die over a plant. To recap, things Jonah gets angry about. God sparing people he doesn't like. God removing a shade plant that God himself provided to begin with. What's Jonah about? Himself, his comfort, his likes, his dislikes, his prejudices. He doesn't like it at all. When God has a different plan than Jonah thinks God should have. Jonah, we have to admit, is not a pretty picture. Not a pretty picture. He's selfish, he's petulant, he's self-righteous, he's self-pitying when he doesn't get his way. When he thinks God is not doing what God ought to do. He resents that God is merciful. And there are some people that are like that. You think, you know, they seem to talk about hell with delight. And the prospect of people they don't like being in hell with glee. Now, yes, we delight in the justice and holiness of God, to be sure. But, dear friends, we live in the day of salvation. We live in the day of grace. The offer of the gospel is the message of the church. Will God judge? Yes. But in the face of that, our message is one of grace and mercy. Our desire is not that people would be struck down by the wrath of God, sent to hell forever to suffer unthinkable torment, justly, yes, for their sin but that Jesus might suffer that for them so they can be in heaven by God's mercy. Let me, let me show you a very different picture. This is Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, verses 15 through 18. Paul is in prison, also not a comfortable place to be, a Roman prison. He writes this, and, and while he's in prison, people are kind of taking advantage. This is what he writes. He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, those who preach out of envy, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. They're out there preaching Christ with at least part of the goal being to, to get at Paul, maybe to gain market share, maybe to make him feel bad. But what is, what is Paul's reaction? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So whether from good motives or bad motives, Paul delights that people are hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's not about him. It's about the gospel. What a great heart. What a, what a big heart. They sat there to get market share maybe on Paul. And he rejoices. That's a big heart. How different from Jonah. A little shriveled, self-focused heart than Jonah. Dear friends, I hope my heart and I hope your heart are more similar in their generosity and in their care and compassion for the souls of people, their desire for the salvation of souls of people than they are for ourselves and our little estate, our little agenda. You know, when other churches get started and grow immensely, do we rejoice or are we envious? Um, when other people succeed or get things, maybe even that we want for ourselves but don't have, are, do we rejoice in the goodness of God, the mercies of God? Or do we envy them and resent them and say bad things about them, look for anything to run them down? You see, that's Jonah. How different from Paul. Whether for good motives or bad, Christ is preached. And in that, I rejoice because... The mercy of God in Jesus is really what it's about. So we look at this and again examine our hearts by light of Jonah's hearts and words, heart and words here. So God questions Jonah's anger over sparing Nineveh. He questions him over the demise of the plant, you know, that Jonah cares about it. And now God questions Jonah about 
God's, his own, mercy. And this is really the end of the chapter, end of the book, verses 10 through 11. It's time for God kind of to have a heart-to-heart with his uh, petulant prophet. Verse 10, the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Your heart goes out for this plant. The Lord meant that plant to be an object lesson. Jonah cared about it. He was concerned for the plant, a plant he had nothing to do with, that God, in his further mercy to Jonah, raised up for Jonah, and in his providence, took away, came up in the night, went out in the night, easy come, easy go. The Lord is right. Jonah cared about that plant because it brought him comfort. It brought him relief from the sun, and that's not a bad thing, but he cared about it. And so then the Lord asks, son lowers the boom, you cared about this plant, should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and much cattle. Now, some take the 120,000 don't know their right hand from the left to be just the children. You have children who are little and literally maybe don't know what the right hand or the left hand is. I don't take it that way. I think he's describing the, the population and not knowing the right hand from the left is, is spiritually speaking. In other words, should I not have pity on this vast city, this vast number of people who, spiritually speaking, don't have a clue about their sin or how to defeat their sin or deal with their sin or how to get relief from the guilt of their sin. The Lord says, you care about the plant. What do you do? Shouldn't I care about this city? Which, by the way, God in his providence had brought into being, had grown, had allowed to exist. I mean, God had much more in this city than Jonah had in that plant. Should I care about this city? And not to mention cattle. That's kind of curious. And cattle, too. Well, remember, the king of Nineveh invited or required the animals to join in the fast. And at the very least, it just goes to show that God cares about animals. We should take care of them and treat them well. Uh, But the animals, too, would perish if the fire fell from heaven and destroyed the city. So, It just shows God's heart. He cares about the people. He even cares about the animals. Jonah even thought about all these animals that would perish in the destruction of the city. God cares about the animals too. And with that question, the book ends. It's meant to make us think. It's directed to Jonah, but it's also directed to us. And it raises other questions that spring from it. What do you care about? Do you care about the things that God cares about? God cares about you. But he cares about more than just you. Can you just say the same of yourself? Of course we care about ourselves. Do you care about others? Do you care about others who don't know Jesus? Because we are happy for God's grace to us in Jesus. Do you want that for others? Or would you really prefer God just snuff them out? Send them to hell because they're sinners. Do you want that for others? We should want God's saving grace for ourselves, and yes, for those we might even count as enemies. You know the expression, you wouldn't wish that on your worst enemy. Dear friends, if we truly grasped what hell is, we would not want that for the people we despise the most. You wouldn't. You would want them to experience God's mercy. Do you desire God's grace and salvation for people whose lifestyles offend you and are sinful, admittedly, Remember, Jesus, as he said himself, did not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners, real sinners, not nice sinners, real sinners, bad sinners. In fact, even the self-righteous, which was the sin Jesus blasted most firmly of all. Do you have a sense of your own sin? Or do you feel somehow that God owes you salvation? Or you deserve his mercy to you? Do you realize that like the Ninevites, and in fact like Jonah, we too deserve God's wrath and justice and displeasure? Do your concerns and your passions extend beyond yourself to those around you? Can you see the world as God sees it? Through the eyes of a compassionate Savior 
who sent his son to save sinners like them and even like us. We are surrounded, even in this neighborhood, surrounded by people who, spiritually speaking, however smart, well-educated, capable they are, who, spiritually speaking, in the things of God, don't know their right hand from their left. They haven't got a clue. Our temptation is to want God's judgment on them. But rather, we should pray that God would grant us great compassion and love for them. We should want God's salvation for them as we do for ourselves. And we should do what we can to extend it to them. Let's pray. Father, forgive us when we have self-righteous, self-justifying hearts before you. Thank you, Lord, for showing us mercy. Thank you for your grace coming to us however it came to us and for your grace that softened our hearts and opened our eyes and unclogged our ears and enabled us to believe and to be saved. Forgive us, Father, when we promptly turn around like the unmerciful servant, having received such grace, such forgiveness, and want justice and wrath for those around us. Father, forgive us. Lord, we thank you that you are a just and holy God. We thank you that you will make all injustices and wrongs and sins right. But Father, we pray for the people we know, the people who surround us, the people even that we don't like, whose sins offend us, that that justice would be satisfied in Christ Jesus and not in them. Lord, that they might be saved, that they might know you, that they would be with us in heaven before your throne, worshiping and praising you for all eternity with us because of your great grace. Father, give us your heart, not Jonas, for this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.